Chapter Fourteen of Bushido, the Soul of Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Awaii in December two thousand and nine. Bushido, the Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. Chapter Fourteen, the Training and Position of Woman. The female half of our species has sometimes been called the paragon of paradoxes because the intuitive working of its mind is beyond the comprehension of men's arithmetical understanding. The Chinese ideogram denoting the mysterious, the unknowable, consists of two parts, one meaning young and the other woman, because the physical charms and delicate thoughts of the fair sex are above the coarse mental caliber of our sex to explain. In the Bushido ideal of woman, however, there is little mystery and only a seeming paradox. I have said that it was Amazonian, but that is only half the truth. Ideographically, the Chinese represent wife by a woman holding a broom, certainly not to brandish it offensively or defensively against her conjugal ally, neither for witchcraft, but for the more harmless uses of which the besom was first invented the idea involved being thus not less homely than the etymological derivation of the English wife, weaver, and daughter, duhitar, milkmaid. Without confining the sphere of women's activity to Küche, Kirche, Kinder, as the present German Kaiser is said to do, the Bushido ideal of womanhood was pre-eminently domestic. These seeming contradictions, domesticity and Amazonian traits, are not inconsistent with the precepts of knighthood, as we shall see. Bushido being a teaching primarily intended for the masculine sex, the virtues it prized in woman were naturally far from being distinctly feminine. Winkelmann remarks that the supreme beauty of Greek art is rather male than female, and Lecky adds that it was true in the moral conception of the Greeks as in their art. Bushido similarly praised those women most who emancipated themselves from the frailty of their sex and displayed a heroic fortitude worthy of the strongest and the bravest of men. Young girls, therefore, were trained to repress their feelings, to indurate their nerves, to manipulate weapons, especially the long-handled sword called naginata, so as to be able to hold their own against unexpected odds. Yet the primary motive for exercises of this martial character was not for use in the field. It was twofold, personal and domestic. Woman owning no caesarean of her own formed her own bodyguard. With her weapon she guarded her personal sanctity with as much zeal as her husband did his master's. The domestic utility of her warlike training was in the education of her sons, as we shall see later. Fencing and similar exercises, if rarely of practical use, were a wholesome counterbalance to the otherwise sedentary habits of woman. But these exercises were not followed only for hygienic purposes. They could be turned into use in times of need. Girls, when they reached womanhood, were presented with dirks, kaiken, pocket poniards, which might be directed to the bosom of their assailants, or, if advisable, to their own. The latter was very often the case, and yet I will not judge them severely. Even the Christian conscience, with its horror of self-immolation, will not be harsh with them, seeing Pelagia and Domnia, two suicides, were canonized for their purity and piety. When a Japanese Virginia saw her chastity menaced, she did not wait for her father's dagger. Her own weapon lay always in her bosom. It was a disgrace to her not to know the proper way in which she had to perpetrate self-destruction. For example, little as she was taught in anatomy, she must know the exact spot to cut in her throat. She must know how to tie her lower limbs together with a belt, so that, whatever the agonies of death might be, her corpse be found in utmost modesty with the limbs properly composed. Is not a caution like this worthy of the Christian Perpetua or the Vestal Cornelia? I would not put such an abrupt interrogation were it not for a misconception based on our bathing customs and other trifles that chastity is unknown among us. On the contrary, chastity was the pre-eminent virtue of the samurai woman held above life itself. 
a young woman taken prisoner seeing herself in danger of violence at the hands of the rough soldiery says she will obey their pleasure provided she be first allowed to write a line to her sisters whom war has dispersed in every direction when the epistle is finished off she runs to the nearest well and saves her honour by drowning the letter she leaves behind ends with these verses for fear lest clouds may dim her light should she but graze this nether sphere the young moon poised above the height doth hastily be take to flight it would be unfair to give my readers an idea that masculinity alone was our highest ideal for woman far from it accomplishments and the gentler graces of life were required of them music dancing and literature were not neglected some of the finest verses in our literature were expressions of feminine sentiments in fact women played an important role in the history of japanese belles lettres dancing was taught i am speaking of samurai girls and not of geisha only to smooth the angularity of their movements music was to regale the weary hours of their fathers and husbands hence it was not for the technique the art as such that music was learned for the ultimate object was purification of heart since it was said that no harmony of sound is attainable without the player's heart being in harmony with herself here again we see the same idea prevailing which we notice in the training of youths that accomplishments were ever kept subservient to moral worth just enough of music and dancing to add grace and brightness to life but never to foster vanity and extravagance I sympathize with the Persian prince who, when taken into a ballroom in London and asked to take part in the merriment, bluntly remarked that in his country they provided a particular set of girls to do that kind of business for them. The accomplishments of our women were not acquired for show or social ascendancy. They were a home diversion, and if they shone in social parties, it was as the attributes of a hostess in other words, as a part of the household contrivance for hospitality. Domesticity guided their education. It may be said that the accomplishments of the women of old Japan, be they martial or pacific in character, were mainly intended for the home, and however far they might roam, they never lost sight of the hearth as the center. It was to maintain its honor and integrity that they slaved, drudged, and gave up their lives night and day in tones at once firm and tender brave and plaintive they sang to their little nests as daughter woman sacrificed herself for her father as wife for her husband and as mother for her son thus from earliest youth she was taught to deny herself her life was not one of independence but of dependent service men's help meet if her presence is helpful she stays on the stage with him if it hinders his work she retires behind the curtain not infrequently does it happen that the youth becomes enamoured of a maiden who returns his love with equal ardour but when she realises that his interest in her makes him forgetful of his duties disfigures her person that her attractions may cease azuma the ideal wife in the minds of samurai girls finds herself loved by a man who in order to win her affection conspires against her husband upon pretense of joining in the guilty plot she manages in the dark to take her husband's place and the sword of the lover assassin descends upon her own devoted head the following epistle written by the wife of a young daimyo before taking her own life needs no comment oft have i heard that no accident or chance ever mars the march of events here below and that all moves in accordance with a plan to take shelter under a common bow or a drink of the same river is alike ordained from ages prior to our birth since we were joined in ties of eternal wedlock now two short years ago my heart hath followed thee even as its shadow followeth an object inseparately bound heart to heart loving and being loved learning but recently however that the coming battle is to be the last of thy labour and life take the farewell greeting of thy loving partner i have heard that ko u the mighty warrior of ancient china lost a battle loth to part with his favourite gu yoshinaka too brave as he was brought disaster to his cause too weak to bid prompt farewell to his wife 
why should i to whom earth no longer offers hope or joy why should i detain thee or thy thoughts by living why should i not rather await thee on the road which all mortal kind must sometime tread never prithee never forget the many benefits which our good master hideyori hath heaped upon thee the gratitude we owe him is as deep as the sea and as high as the hills woman's surrender of herself to the good of her husband home and family was as willing and honourable as the man's self-surrender to the good of his lord and country self-renunciation without which no life enigma can be solved was the keynote of the loyalty of man as well as of the domesticity of woman she was no more the slave of man than was her husband of his liege lord and the part she played was recognized as naijo the inner help in the ascending scale of service stood woman who annihilated herself for man that he might annihilate himself for the master that he in turn might obey heaven I know the weakness of this teaching, and that the superiority of Christianity is nowhere more manifest than here, and that it requires of each and every living soul direct responsibility to its Creator. Nevertheless, as far as the doctrine of service, the serving of a cause higher than one's own self, even at the sacrifice of one's individuality, I say the doctrine of service, which is the greatest that Christ preached, and is the sacred keynote of his mission, as far as that is concerned bushido is based on eternal truth my readers will not accuse me of undue prejudice in favour of slavish surrender of volition i accept in a large measure the view advanced with breath of learning and defended with profundity of thought by hegel that history is the unfolding and realization of freedom the point i wish to make is that the whole teaching of bushido was so thoroughly imbued with the spirit of self-sacrifice that it was required not only of woman but of man hence until the influence of its precepts is entirely done away with our society will not realize the view rashly expressed by an american exponent of women's rights who exclaimed may all the daughters of japan rise in revolt against ancient customs can such a revolt succeed will it improve the female status will the rights they gain by such a summary process repay the loss of that sweetness of disposition that gentleness of manner which are their present heritage was not the loss of domesticity on the part of roman matrons followed by moral corruption too gross to mention can the american reformer assure us that a revolt of our daughters is the true course for their historical development to take these are grave questions. Changes must and will come without revolts. In the meantime, let us see whether the status of the fair sex under the Bushido regimen was really so bad as to justify a revolt. We hear much of the outward respect European knights paid to God and the ladies, the incongruity of the two terms making Gibbon blush. We are also told by Hallam that the morality of chivalry was coarse, that gallantry implied illicit love. The effect of chivalry on the weaker vessel was food for reflection on the part of philosophers, M. Guizot contending that feudalism and chivalry wrought wholesome influences, while Mr. Spencer tells us that in a militant society, and what is feudal society if not militant, the position of woman is necessarily low, improving only as society becomes more industrial now is m guizot's theory true of japan or is mr spencer's in reply i might aver that both are right the military class in japan was restricted to the samurai comprising nearly two million souls above them were the military nobles the daimyo and the court nobles the kuge these higher sybaritical nobles being fighters only in name below them were masses of the common people mechanics tradesmen and peasants whose life was devoted to arts of peace thus what herbert spencer gives as the characteristics of a militant type of society may be said to have been exclusively confined to the samurai class while those of the industrial type were applicable to the classes above and below it this is well illustrated by the position of woman for in no class did she experience less freedom than among the samurai strange to say the lower the social class as for instance among small artisans the more equal was the position of husband and wife 
among the higher nobility too, the difference in the relations of the sexes was less marked, chiefly because there were few occasions to bring the differences of sex into prominence, the leisurely nobleman having become literally effeminate. Thus, Spencer's dictum was fully exemplified in old Japan. As to Guizot's, those who read his presentation of a feudal community will remember that he had the higher nobility especially under consideration, so that his generalization applies to the daimyo and the kuge. I shall be guilty of gross injustice to historical truth if my words give one a very low opinion of the status of woman under Bushido. I do not hesitate to state that she was not treated as man's equal but until we learn to discriminate between difference and inequalities, there will always be misunderstandings upon this subject. When we think in how few respects men are equal among themselves, that is, before law courts or voting polls, it seems idle to trouble ourselves with a discussion of the equality of sexes. When the American Declaration of Independence said that all men were created equal, it had no reference to their mental or physical gifts, it simply repeated what Ulpian long ago announced, that before the law all men are equal. Legal rights were in this case the measure of their equality. Were the law the only scale by which to measure the position of woman in a community, it would be as easy to tell where she stands as to give her avoir du poids in pounds and ounces. But the question is, is there a correct standard in comparing the relative social position of the sexes, is it right, is it enough, to compare women's status to men's as the value of silver is compared with that of gold and give the ratio numerically? Such a method of calculation excludes from consideration the most important kind of value which a human being possesses, namely the intrinsic. In view of the manifold variety of requisites for making each sex fulfill its earthly mission, the standard to be adopted in measuring its relative position must be of a composite character, or, to borrow from economic language, it must be a multiple standard. Bushido had a standard of its own, and it was binomial. It tried to gauge the value of woman on the battlefield and by the hearth. There she counted for very little, here for all. The treatment accorded her corresponded to this double measurement, as a social-political unit not much, while as wife and mother she received highest respect and deepest affection. Why among so military a nation as the Romans were their matrons so highly venerated? Was it not because they were matrona, mothers? Not as fighters or lawgivers, but as their mothers did men bow before them. So with us. While fathers and husbands were absent in field or camp, the government of the household was left entirely in the hands of mothers and wives. The education of the young, even their defense, was entrusted to them. The warlike exercises of women, of which I have spoken, were primarily to enable them intelligently to direct and follow the education of their children. I have noticed a rather superficial notion prevailing among half-informed foreigners that because the common Japanese expression for one's wife is my rustic wife and the like, she is despised and held in little esteem. When it is told that such phrases as my foolish father, my swinish son, my awkward self, etc. are in current use, is not the answer clear enough? To me it seems that our idea of marital union goes in some ways further than the so-called Christian. Man and woman shall be one flesh. The individualism of the Anglo-Saxon cannot let go of the idea that husband and wife are two persons. Hence, when they disagree, their separate rights are recognized, and when they agree, they exhaust their vocabulary in all sorts of silly pet names and nonsensical blandishments. It sounds highly irrational to our ears when a husband or wife speaks to a third party of his other half, better or worse, as being lovely, bright, kind, and what not. Is it good taste to speak of oneself as my bright self, my lovely disposition, and so forth? We think praising one's own wife or one's own husband is praising a part of one's own self, and self-praise is regarded, to say the least, as bad taste among us, and I hope among Christian nations too. 
I have diverged at some length because the polite debasement of one's consort was a usage most in vogue among the samurai. The Teutonic races, beginning their tribal life with a superstitious awe of the fair sex, though this is really wearing off in Germany, and the Americans beginning their social life under the painful consciousness of the numerical insufficiency of women, who, now increasing, are, I am afraid, fast losing the prestige their colonial mothers enjoyed. The respect man pays to woman has in Western civilization become the chief standard of morality. But in the martial ethics of Bushido, the main watershed dividing the good and the bad was sought elsewhere. It was located along the line of duty, which bound man to his own divine soul and then to other souls, in the five relations I have mentioned in the early part of this paper. Of these we have brought to our readers notice loyalty, the relation between one man as vassal and another as lord. Upon the rest I have only dwelt incidentally, as occasion presented itself, because they were not peculiar to Bushido. Being founded on natural affections, they could but be common to all mankind, though in some particulars they may have been accentuated by conditions which its teachings induced. In this connection there comes before me the peculiar strength and tenderness of friendship between man and man, which often added to the bond of brotherhood a romantic attachment doubtless intensified by the separation of the sexes in youth a separation which denied to affection the natural channel open to it in western chivalry or in the free intercourse of anglo-saxon lands i might fill pages with japanese versions of the story of daemon and pythias or achilles and patroclos or tell in bushido parlance of ties as sympathetic as those which bound david and jonathan End of chapter 14.